Um, so I'm, um, as was mentioned, I'm a, a neurosurgeon. I happen to work at um, the Hospital for Sick Children, which is one of the largest uh, pediatric uh, hospitals of its kind in the world. I've been on uh, faculty now for 30 years. And I can remember being in your positions, that is to say, uh, as medical students, wondering, you know, what the next steps will be, uh, thinking about applying to uh, various programs. Uh, perhaps like some of you, when I was a medical student, I uh, initially was not sure which uh, career path I was going to follow. And it wasn't until I did a kind of elective rotation at, um, at Sick Kids Hospital, where I actually happened to work, uh, many years ago that uh, I just immediately knew that neurosurgery was for me. And so from that point uh, forward, I uh, focused all of my attentions into getting into a pediatric uh, neurosurgery position. But uh, prior to that, of course, training in, in neurosurgery, uh, which took, um, as you know, uh, some time to do uh, with the, the years that are required but also I went on and, and did uh, research training and that's been a large part of my uh, career as an academic neurosurgeon. So um, with that kind of introduction and maybe at the end, if there are questions about um, neurosurgery applications, uh, residency programs, um, uh, leadership, mentorship, whatever, I'd be very happy to answer those things uh, for, this, uh, for this group. So we'll begin and just, um, some information about the terminology. Um, you know, there's a few different types of Chiari malformations, and the one that you've been hearing most about, I'm sure, this past uh, series has been the Chiari one, which is the caudal displacement of the uh, cerebellar tonsils. Uh, there's Chiari two, which is herniation of the cerebellar vermis, not the tonsils, but the vermis. So that's the central midline cerebellar structure into the foramen magnum or through it, uh, the brainstem and the fourth ventricle all sort of migrate uh, down through. There's the Chiari three malformation, which is herniation of the cerebellum and the brainstem, typically into a, uh, an encephalocele, which is an outpouching or hernia of the contents of the, uh, the brain into a sac uh, posteriorly. And uh, Chiari four, which is represented by uh, cerebellar hypoplasia. Uh, you may hear other terminologies like Chiari 0, Chiari uh, you know, 0.5, 1.5, etc. It kind of relates to um, gradations of the Chiari 1 malformation. And I actually don't use that uh, terminology myself. I keep it kind of simple and, and just say it's a, you know, it's a significant Chiari malformation or it's a, a mild Chiari malformation. So um, this is um, kind of the stuff we're talking about here. Okay, so just in diagrammatic form, this is what happens, uh, normal situation on this schematic. And then with the Chiari 1 malformation, you can see the cerebellar tonsils uh, that are herniating through, the crowding at the foramen magnum level, and the generation of um, backup of the cerebrospinal fluid into the spinal cord, and that's called a, a syrinx, and hence gives the name of the condition, which is syringomyelia. There's Chiari 2, Chiari 3, and Chiari 4, all displayed there for you. I'll have a, a better image of the Chiari 2 malformation to show you subsequently in this uh, presentation. Uh, this is Chiari 3, which is herniation into a large uh, posterior kind of um, uh, meningocele or encephalocele as shown here. And this uh, Chiari 4 represents um, the cerebellar hypoplasia. You know, for all intents and purposes, these latter two, I don't um, see very often. None of us does. They're pretty rare conditions. Uh, but Chiari 1 and Chiari 2 um, are the most common. And Chiari 1 is way more common nowadays than Chiari 2, given the fact that uh, spina bifida, at least in the developing world, is um, a vanishing disorder and is something that is seen less and less. When I was um, at your level, so when I was a medical student, and this would have been 1979, 1980, so long before you guys were born, or probably most of you, um, the incidence of spina bifida and uh, neural tube defects at sick kids was uh, extremely high. So there would be at least one patient, sometimes two patients coming in with 
with uh, myelomeningocele's and um, coming in with carry two malformations every week of the year. So that would mean like over a hundred new admissions um, for children with myelomeningocele. Uh, now, if we see ten a year, so you know a tenth of that uh, number, we're that's a lot. Now, so it's it's really dropped off. And so uh, for myself, I had a lot of experience when I first started my clinical practice closing myelomeningocele and then dealing with the Chiari two malformation that you see here. But uh, more recently, um, it's pretty rare that I would close a um, neural tube defect and or see a Chiari two malformation. Uh, we are actively involved in fetal myelomeningocele repair at Sick Kids Hospital. So we do have a program for that. Um, and it, it is interesting. That's probably equal numbers now that we're treating, if not more so, um, in utero, so fetal uh, repairs versus kind of open repairs of, um, of um, myelomeningocele. So uh, the world has changed a lot, and I suspect that those numbers of in utero and fetal repairs are going to drop off uh, even further over time for a variety of reasons perhaps we can talk about. So... Uh, Pathophysiology, you've learned this already in the different lectures you've received, Chiari 1, uh, can be congenital or acquired. Um, we actually don't know the, the uh, basic um, pathophysiology in the sense that what causes a Chiari 1 malformation in most instances, but it's thought that it may relate to defects in the mesoderm that creates overall a small container, if you will, or capacity for the posterior fossa. There can be some associated cranial facial defects like Cruzon syndrome is a cranial facial abnormality that's often associated with the Chiari malformation. Uh, rickets, although I've never seen a case, I have seen growth hormone deficiency. I'm gonna show you a case uh, later in the presentation, but all of them are associated with impaired cerebral spinal fluid gradients across the frame and magnum. And Chiari 2, um, thought to be an in utero pressure gradient where with the opened neural tube defect, uh, as mentioned, the vermis of the cerebellum and the brainstem to a degree, but the fourth ventricle all sort of migrate down below the frame and magnum level. Uh, Sphingomyelia is caused by a pressure differential between the cranial and spinal compartments. And um, I showed you an image of that, a sketch of that. I'll show you some MRI scans of that uh, as this presentation goes on. But if you really wanna look at some of the best literature on the topic of syringomyelia, you need to go to the works of uh, Dr. Ed Oldfield. Sadly, he's uh, passed. Um, he was a very talented um, academic neurosurgeon who specialized in pituitary surgery, but also uh, he was a uh, neurosurgeon scientist and worked at the NIH for a number of years, um, was also on faculty at the University of Virginia. But uh, he helped to elucidate the pathophysiology of this uh, condition. I refer you to his works that are published in uh, the Journal of Neurosurgery. And here's another one of his works on the pathophysiology of syringomyelia after decompressive uh, craniocervical surgery and another one from the Journal of Neurosurgery dating back um, a number of years, almost 30 years, uh, carry malformation and, and descent of the cerebellar tonsils. So these are classics in the literature. They happen to be published in all of them in the uh, Journal of Neurosurgery. So you can refer to some of these uh, for those of you who are interested in this topic. As far as the symptom complex, we just spend a moment on the Chiari 1. You have symptoms like occipital headaches, which is quite uh, a common feature, especially during episodes of um, raised intra-abdominal pressure. So if you cough or sneeze or strain and you raise your intra-abdominal pressure, that often sets off this occipital uh, headache in a variety of patients. Uh, motor and sensory uh, issues, clumsiness, ataxia, of course. Uh, brainstem findings like nystagmus, lower cranial nerve palsies, recurrent aspiration, uh, tongue atrophy, and then spinal cord alterations like uh, sensory motor loss, hyporeflexia or hyperreflexia, the Babinski sign, foot drop. I've seen all of these occur before. Uh, 
and uh, oscillopsia, hiccups, and scoliosis. And um, if there's a syrinx uh, that's uh, present in the carry one malformation, one of the best tests you can do at the bedside is uh, do the abdominal reflexes because the abdominal reflexes will be distinctly abnormal, typically on one side, occasionally on both sides, in uh, a patient who has um, a significant uh, syrinx in the spinal cord. Okay, and this is now versus Chiari 2 malformations where in infants, which is usually where Chiari 2 malformations will present because again, this is a, a condition associated with um, neural tube de defect or myelomeningocele. And in infants, it typically presents sometimes as an emergency. So you get strider, central apnea, aspirations happening, failure to thrive, hypotonia, in older children, you can get hand weakness, myelopathies, ataxia, strabismus, nystagmus, scoliosis, dysarthria. But these are the signs that uh, you would have to look at in order to determine the timing of surgery. And, and some of them may be emergency signs. So I've often had to operate on very young uh, children, babies, in fact, uh, just after birth for uh, decompressing their Chiari 2 malformation, and that's uh, not an unusual uh, situation that we would see. Okay, so there are some diagnostic studies that you've uh, learned of already. Uh, the best, of course, to date is the MRI, both of the brain and the spine, to diagnose whether there's hydrocephalus there, whether there's syrinx there, to get a characterization of the crowding in the posterior fossa and, and the way that the posterior fossa appears. There are flow studies that can be done typically on MRI using this um, sequence that's called uh, the cine mode um, uh, MR. You can do electrophysiological studies, um, especially if somebody's got a foot drop, you might want to do uh, nerve conduction studies, for example, or EMGs or something. Uh, genetics, uh, because as we mentioned, there might be an occasion to look at some uh, syndromic forms of Chiari, uh, Cruzon syndrome, as I mentioned, uh, vitamin D resistant rickets or something like that to where there might be an underlying cause for that. Uh, sometimes you might want to get a craniofacial consultation, especially if the, um, the facies, the, um, the appearance of the patient's um, face looks uh, distinctly abnormal. That would be a reasonable thing to do. Okay. These are some imaging studies across the board. You can take a look at, and here's um the Chiari, top left is the Chiari malformation. You can see the syrinx that forms here. Um, here you can see um, the descent of the, the brainstem, like all the way down here. Here you can see this kind of knuckling that occurs at the junction between the uh, cerebellum and the brainstem. Uh, again, same sort of situation here that you can see with this uh, syrinx in the middle of the spinal cord, the abnormal uh, brainstem findings here. And uh, here you're seeing a CT uh, myelogram. Now, this is a study that's almost never done these days. But when I was um, at your stage, a medical student, and, and after as a resident, and even as a junior faculty, um, so 30 years ago, we were still doing these studies time to time to take a look at the posterior fossa and to see if the tonsils were descended through the uh, foramen magnum. And that would tell us whether or not there was a, a Chiari malformation there. So this is a mixture of uh, Chiari 1 and Chiari 2 images that you can see there. And um, the treatment, I'll just you know skip right to the bottom line in terms of treatment. If you're seeing a patient with these um, Chiari malformations, depending on whether it's Chiari 1 or Chiari 2, uh, Chiari 1, it's uh, posterior fossa decompression, uh, tonsillopexy or doing something to mobilize tonsils and duraplasty. Um, there's also a move afoot, uh, I'll get to the literature on this, to do the posterior fossa decompression as a bony kind of skull uh, decompression without opening the dura, without doing a duraplasty. And there's some data to suggest that that's um, not a bad treatment. It's a much uh, better tolerated uh, by the patient. And I'll show you some uh, studies that uh, indicate why that's not a, uh, you know, a, a wrong thing or it's not a bad thing to do in, in certain uh, circumstances. And then there's a, uh, the symptomatic Chiari 2 malformations, as mentioned, with the myelomeningocele. Uh, 
The, uh, the treatment is not so much posterior fossa uh, decompression as it is a cervical laminectomy. I'll describe that in more detail to you, but most of the compression for Chiari 2 happens in the cervical spine as opposed to in the occipital bone area. And um, you have to really study your MRI scan to know whether the, um, the tentorium, which uh, essentially is fairly horizontal in, uh, in most uh, individuals, uh, but in Chiari 2 malformation, it's angled down towards the foramen magnum. But if it is, then you know that that's where the um, junction of the superior sagittal sinus and the lateral or the transverse sinuses is located. And if that's pulled way down towards the frame of magnum, you start opening a dura and you think that um, you could open way up into the posterior fossa. You're going to cut across the lateral or even the superior sagittal sinus, and that can be essentially catastrophic. So you, you definitely need to study your MRI scans in advance. Okay, so I'm going to show you some cases. Um, this is the first case of a child, 16-year-old um, rugby player. So an athlete who was really bothered by headaches, and uh, especially after a Valsalva maneuver. So Valsalva is when you strain against a closed uh, glottis, and uh, this would elicit usually an occipital type of headache, or sneezing or coughing or something would do the same thing. And it's, it's quite a typical uh, feature of this um, condition. His neurological exam was normal, including the uh, abdominal reflexes and so on. There's no scoliosis in this child's case. So 16 year old, so older uh, child adolescent. And there you can see the tonsils going down past the frame of magnum, which I'm showing you here. And there's no syrinx in the spinal cord. So this is a video that shows the bony exposure. The occipital bone is here. We've already opened the dura now. I open it in kind of a Y-shaped uh, pattern. And now we're mobilizing, these are the cerebellar tonsils. We're just mobilizing them to get them to be smaller, rounded, to come up towards the uh, obex. And you, at the end of the day, you wanna be able to see the uh, obex because that tells you that you've um, identified the opening of the, uh, the bottom part of the fourth ventricle that allows then the CSF to come out and to circulate uh, properly. And uh, getting back to this case, this was the preoperative analysis, and uh, this is post-op. So clearly, I think you can see the difference. The tonsils, cerebellar tonsils, have been kind of dragged down here. And now, after we did the uh, tonsillopexy, that means uh, coagulating the, the tonsils, rounding them up uh, in the cerebellum, you've got all this space behind the, the cerebellum. And now this is quite opened up, whereas on this side, on the left side, it's kind of closed over, right? So I think you can immediately see the difference between the two. And that's, um, that's what I would consider to be a good result. And I usually quote uh, patients who have had carry one malformation, a 90 to 95% success rate of improvement in their symptoms and their radiology. Uh, but there are some failures and I'll show you an example of uh, failure as uh, the presentation goes on. Okay, next case. Um, a symptomatic carry with a syrinx this time, an eight-year-old female, some mild developmental delay, ataxia, delayed language, mild uh, scoliosis happening. And here's the MRI scan. There's something a little bit funny about this MRI. I'm going to leave it here for a second so you can all look at it. And um, yeah, you'll, you'll sort of wonder what's missing here, and I'll tell you in a moment. Uh, but here's the uh, MR of the spine. So you can see the quite distinct Chiari malformation, which you can catch here. You start to see the top of the syrinx here, but on this T2 weighted image, you actually see the, the syrinx much better. You can see the compression here. But what are we missing here? I'm going to show you in a second with an arrow. Arrow is pointing at absence of the uh, corpus callosum. So this uh, patient also has some underlying genetic disturbance that led to absence of the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is the major association fiber bundle that takes information from one hemisphere and transfers it to the other. Here's the video in this case. So hopefully these videos are showing up for you. So we're doing some dissection of the arachnoid. We've already opened up the, the dura. We've taken up obviously the bone off. And now we're preparing the cerebellar tonsils for the tonsillopexy. 
and we would do coagulation just like that, rounding up the tonsils. Um, and uh, this is very well tolerated. It does not seem to cause any underlying uh, significant uh, disturbance when you do that. And you can see the dissection that's required. All of that's done under the microscope, at least uh, in my uh, institution. We do carry malformations at that stage under the microscope. And here's the before. Once again, large syrinx, multi-septated uh, syrinx. And here's the after. So I think you would all agree that's much better in terms of the resolution of the syrinx. There's still a tiny syrinx here, but you can see the nice rounding of the tonsils, which are quite pointed here. And that's uh, the kind of result I like to see after this case. Okay, and then uh, another case kind of interesting uh, is with a syrinx with post-operative worsening of the syrinx, and you'll see that. Uh, three, so this is a young child, so younger than the previous two children. Uh, six month history of headaches, neck pain, ataxia, and no scoliosis, but has this MRI scan, three year old, clearly with headaches and uh, neck pain, and has these uh, pointed tonsils coming through the frame of magnum. Frame of magnum is here. This is the uh, bottom of the occipital bone. C1 is here, and C2 is back here. And it's uh, definitely crowded back here. I'm going to show you this case. Um, but, but I also want to say just before that, um, the video that I show, there is something happening right here, a little bit of a white spot that you can see on this T2 image. And that becomes uh, important when we discuss the complication of this case that arose. So uh, in, in comparison to the previous cases, in this case, look how mobile the posterior fossa is, it's really pulsating, right? You see that? And you didn't see that in the previous two cases. So there was something really dynamic going on here. And we're doing the tonsillopexy, kind of shriveling up the tonsils, making them nice and round. This is the cerebellum. Beneath that, you see the brainstem uh, down here. I always keep these cotinoids on the brainstem to avoid injury uh, to it. And uh, that's how we do the procedure intradurally, and then we close with um, a dural patch and so on to create the extra room that's required. And as I said, you can expect a very high success rate uh, in these cases. Now, uh, this was a complicated case, same case. I'm just going to show you what happened. This is before. Well, we did the surgery. We got some uh, degree of um, uh, cerebral spinal fluid behind the cerebellum, and the tonsils aren't so pointed, but that white spot that was in the high cervical spinal cord has gotten worse. So I was, I was really disturbed when I saw this and quite uh, disappointed, of course. Uh, so I had to go back to surgery um, sometime later and then open it up uh, even more. And this led, of course, to the resolution of the syrinx and after the second operation. So um, that was a, a, you know, an instructive case for me. And it was, um, yeah, I was glad we were able to to um, go back and, and help this child get better and everything is fine. This child's been no problem has uh, essentially, this is, you know, many years later is doing extremely well. Okay, and this is another uh, illustrative case, a 10 year old female who's had vomiting and headaches, had this um, condition of congenital hypopituitarism or growth hormone deficiency. There's, there's a literature on this. I've only seen a few cases in my career so far that I've been aware of. And uh, this child had um, actually a very small pituitary gland and had a uh, deficiency of the pituitary hormone output uh, from the hypothalamic pituitary axis, underwent uh, the Chiari decompression for what you see here, and um, laminectomy and tonsil, just like I did and like I showed you, and this is uh, back a number of years. And after the first um, surgery, we still had uh, a syrinx uh, present. It really didn't get much better. She was relatively asymptomatic with this syrinx. There was no scoliosis, but um, this was a problem, I thought. So I wondered what we should do next. Uh, we waited a little bit. She got headaches again. You can see that we had decompressed, but um, have some fluid back here for sure. So we went on to do a, a repeat uh, decompression, uh, C2 laminic derplasty. Um, and there's the fluid now. It's gone up in, in size that you can see. Um, and the syrinx came down. If you compare uh, 
left-hand side to right-hand side, the syrinx is smaller. So I thought, yeah, we're on our way. This is like six months later. I thought everything's under control, no problem, but let's see what happens on the next slide. So again, this was May, but when we followed up in August, she was asymptomatic, but her syrinx came back again, despite having even more fluid uh, in the area where you'd expect to have good circulation of CSF. So um, we looked for a, a disturbance of the cerebral spinal fluid pathways. And if you look on the left-hand side, the ventricles before the first uh, surgery looked like this. But then after the second surgery, you can clearly see the difference. They were getting uh, larger in size. So Here's the sagittal MRI scan uh, showing absence of the pituitary there, but also, you know, some weird stuff happening down here. The fact that the ventricles had gone up. So I decided that we would do something called an endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Some of you may have seen that procedure, but it's an attempt to bypass obstruction of the brain fluid pathways by avoiding a, a shunt placement. So a ventricular peritoneal shunt, avoiding that and doing an internal bypass by making a stoma or a hole at the floor of the third ventricle and allowing fluid to pass. And we did that, her symptoms got better, but her syrinx still uh, persisted. So um, I'll just stop there for a second because uh, that case was very interesting. And um, she had been on um, growth hormone replacement um, and um, I think it was until such time that she got to reach skeletal maturity and she came off of growth hormone replacement. When she came off of growth hormone replacement, for some reason, I guess things had normalized for her or whatever. And she ended up um, getting the syrinx better spontaneously. It just got better by itself. And as I said, she was relatively asymptomatic at that point. I wasn't that worried or concerned about her symptoms, but just the weirdest case that uh, the syrinx that you see here had gone away spontaneously, something to do with the, you know, the way that her, her maturity occurred eventually that she didn't need growth hormone anymore. And um, that was a, a fascinating case to me. So uh, some nuances for the surgery. And I know this is kind of ahead of you guys because you're not quite uh, in the neurosurgery programs yet, but you will be. And then you can look ahead to doing some Chiari malformation uh, cases in your residence is quite a common operation in all hospitals um, that do neurosurgery. You need uh, decent uh, bony decompression. So the occipital bone's been removed, the door has been opened. You can see the uh, cerebral hemispheres and the tonsils. You need to open up into the uh, area of the fourth ventricle, which is by going in the midline between the cerebellar tonsils to make sure that the obex is exposed. And at the end, you do this uh, duraplasty. So you put a patch here and you sew it in place and uh, you make sure there's enough ample uh, decompression that's been performed uh, to do this operation. So this is the tried and true method. It's a standard method. We'll talk about other ways of dealing with this um, subsequently. Uh, after surgery, um, headache can occur. That's complication, sometimes usually from just the alteration in the CSF dynamics. If you get a CSF leak happening, uh, that's a problem because that can set up the stage for meningitis. Uh, you can also get hydrocephalus if you're unlucky, if patient's unlucky, and get uh, a need for some kind of CSF diversion, whether it's a shunting or a, a endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Uh, persistent syrinx or recurrence of syrinx, as I showed you in some of my cases. Uh, something called cerebellar slump. If you take too much bone away, there's no support to hold the cerebellum up. And so it can drop down into the uh, uh, decompression site. And that's not a good thing to have. Pa patients can become uh, quite symptomatic from that. So um, there are some articles and I'm showing uh, this one here. This is uh, published in the Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics and it's on the use of this uh, duroplasty, which I showed you a picture of and obex exploration compared to bone only decompression. So just taking away the bone, but not doing a duroplasty. And the conclusions from this paper was that um, patients presenting with a syrinx who underwent expansile duroplasty and obex had a greater chance of syrinx and symptom resolution uh, 
without increased risk of CSF related complications compared to those who underwent bone only decompression. So if you have a syrinx, then it's probably best to open up and uh, let things um, kind of uh, settle down. On the other hand, uh, if there's no syrinx, but there is like bony um, uh, compression, sometimes bone only decompression is sufficient and you haven't opened the dura and you haven't subjected the patient to the risk of CSF leak and meningitis and so on. And that by itself might be uh, sufficient for some of these cases. And here's the example of the OBEX exploration in this article. I'm just taking uh, pictures, uh, lysis of adhesions and um, showing the OBEX that's been opened up here and uh, after lysis of adhesion. So yeah, you've got to, uh, you have to be good at microneural surgery to do a good carry decompression. It's a nice operation. It's a great operation. I would say it's an operation that uh, junior to mid-range level residents should be able to do. Uh, as I said, it's a common operation at many, many hospitals. It occurs both in uh, children and in adults. Okay, another one is outcomes. As our, another article in the Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics, outcomes in children undergoing posterior fossa decompression and duroplasty with and without tonsillar uh, reduction for QRE1 and a, a pilot uh, prospective study. And essentially what this is showing you is a difference between the duroplasty and the duroplasty with um, uh, tonsillar uh, reduction. And, and so my um, demonstration to you of doing that tonsillar pexy was what I called it, is a demonstration of that. And you can see what happened in this uh, patient population and not a lot of p-value alterations that were different between the two groups, which was uh, interesting uh, when you consider these things. So headache, Valsalva, these, these types of things. Um, so it doesn't look like uh, tonsillar reduction has uh, much to do with the end result. Um, so it's kind of up to you to decide whether or not uh, you want to do it. I, I do it typically because I really like what I see on the post-operative MRI uh, images. And when I haven't done it, I've had uh, one or two cases that have had to go back to surgery because there was still significant blockage at the foramen magnum. Okay. Another paper recently is 2021, uh, Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics. Again, dural augmentation approaches and complication rates after posterior fossa decompression for Chiari 1 and syringomyelia. The bottom line is that the compl rate, complication rates of dural autograft and non autologous graft, so something off the shelf you're using to patch as opposed to the person's own um, material, uh, fascia to, to, to graft, uh, results in about the same outcomes. But that said, pseudo meningocele rates were a little bit higher in the non autologous um, group and just slightly higher meningitis rates, but um, the uh, equivalency in terms of reduction in syrinx size was the same, headache and so on, all those things were equal. Uh, I just think it makes sense to use somebody's own tissue if you can. So I, I typically harvest the uh, pericranium from the occipital and parietal area. I get a nice uh, piece of that to use as my patch as opposed to something off the shelf. Okay, another paper not too long ago, 2020, uh, JNS Pediatrics again, uh, radiological and clinical associations with scoliosis outcomes after posterior fossa decompression in patients with Chiari malformation and syrinx. So, you know, the, all these papers are part of this um, research consortium, and it's been, it's been good to see what's come out of this uh, consortium over time. So in this cohort of patients with Chiari 1, Syrinx, scoliosis, younger age at the time of decompression was associated with a better improvement in curve, that is the scoliosis, especially if you're under 10 years of age and with curves less than 35. So what, what's that to mean is that um, if you get the patient soon enough, the curves are less than 35 and they're younger uh, children, then the chances of the scoliosis improving afterwards is increased. Okay. I think this is the last uh, paper, but just to show you, there's a lot of literature that's coming out on this uh, whole topic and what to do. And it's giving, it's informing us as to how we should look after, you know, our patients. So uh, timing of syrinx reduction and stabilization after posterior fossa decompression for Chiari malformation, 
the maximum reduction in syrinx can be expected within three months after posterior fossa decompression. But they continue to even regress after that time. So you get most in the first three months, but you can still get some afterwards. Um, in this particular paper, um, the syrinx reduction that you can see here um, happened better with tonsillar coagulation than without. So, you know, that that's still, the jury's still kind of not worked out in that one. Okay, so that's a, pretty much a lot of stuff on Chiari 1. Maybe now we'll just go to uh, Chiari 2 malformations and, and spend a, a little bit of time on this because um, it's not as common as it is, you know, the Chiari 1. So, um, and by the time you get into your uh, positions of um, residency and faculty, there'll probably be even less cases, in my opinion. So, um, this this rears its head, the carry 2 rears its head often in the early postnatal period in uh, children that have neural tube defects like myelomeningocele. Uh, strider and apnea can be emergency signs. And as mentioned, a cervical laminectomy is required uh, below the level of the hindbrain herniation. And as mentioned to you before, the torcula, right? So that's where the sinuses all converge. Uh, maybe lying low. So you want to be careful about that. And here's an example of what this looks like. So um, here's cerebellum, of course, but what you're seeing here is the uh, vermis that's kind of coming right down. It's got this kink in the medulla, uh, cervical medullary kink that you can see here. It's quite common. Uh, the tentorium is normally lying like this, so kind of horizontal, but here it's more vertical. And, you know, and sometimes I've seen them all the way down to um, C1, the, the insertion of the um, torcula can be all the way down here. And if you start opening the dura merrily across the um, sagittal sinus, you'll regret it, uh, you know, um, the rest of your life because that's a really bad complication to have. So study your MRI scans carefully. Make sure you know where this is located. If it's way down here, be very careful about opening up any dura. The real operation here is between C1 and uh, C3 or so in this kind of case. Uh, so taking off the posterior cervical lamina is important. Uh, these are just some interoperative images of Chiari 2 malformation showing you what it looks like uh, in, the, in the days when we did a lot of these uh, decompressions. And I must say, it's becoming less and less uh, common nowadays to have to do uh, Chiari uh, 2 decompression procedures, but um, it's quite a bit different than the Chiari 1 that I demonstrated to you. Okay, so for Chiari 1, um, here's a treatment algorithm. And if you don't have um, a syrinx, you've excluded the fact that there's no hydrocephalus there, there's no ventral uh, compression or instability of the spinal uh, axis, and no syrinx. If it's um, greater than seven mil millimeters of caudal descent, and this is asymptomatic, uh, you use your judgment and you can decide. I typically, I don't typically operate on uh, children who don't have any symptoms uh, in my practice. Uh, that said, why are these kids brought to our attention? How, why do they get an MRI scan? Sometimes they're getting it um, just incidentally because they're involved in some study that's looking at, let's say, resting state MRI of the brain uh, or autism or something like that. And they come to your clinic and they have a Chiari malformation that's asymptomatic. Um, it, certainly if they're not showing a lot of um, tonsillar herniation, I, I, I wait. But even here, I'm, you know, I might suggest you know, don't get too fancy about treating the asymptomatic children. If there's a syrinx though, I almost always will go to um, Chiari decompression because I know that over time a syrinx will lead to uh, paraspinal muscular imbalance, and that can lead to scoliosis. Now, okay, let's take the symptomatic uh, Chiari malformation. Again, if you're excluding hydrocephalus and these things, and there's no syrinx, and you have this degree, so not much in the way of descent, you can exercise your judgment and decide when it's time to decompress these ones. But if there's um, less than three millimeters of descent, you know, I would just continue to watch these ones because these ones really, it, it's not clear to me that there's a role if it's only three millimeters, but in any event, um, you know, there's no substitute for clinical judgment here. With greater than uh, this amount of um, descent of the tonsils, 
I would do a, a carry decompression if they're symptomatic. And if a, if a syrinx is present, uh, I certainly, as mentioned to you, would do a, um, a decompression. Asymptomatic carry too, no syrinx, just watch them out. Um, if there's a large syrinx, um, yeah, you could consider doing a, a cervical laminectomy and syringal pleural shunt as possibilities. You have a syrinx here. You want to make sure that most of these kids will have shunts because of the myelomeningocele. And so if it's a small syrinx, you can observe. So again, if, if most folks are asymptomatic, you just can watch, wait, and see most of the time. But if they're symptomatic, you know, start at the top, look at the shunt function. If there's a large syrinx, um, it, you, what you want to do is uh, a laminectomy and, and possibly a little bit of the a posterior fossa decompression. And if there's a syrinx present for sure and, and symptomatic, um, and there's a small to moderate syrinx, you can do a laminectomy and a limited uh, posterior fossa decompression. So if there's a large syrinx, as mentioned, you can do this other procedure, which is a, a shunting operation, but uh, that's, that's pretty sophisticated stuff. And uh, I don't think we need to dwell on that uh, so much uh, today. Okay, so I'm going to wrap things up now and uh, just give you some, uh, you know, conclusions from this uh, presentation. For Chiari 1, you can expect a pretty good improvement rate, as mentioned, 90% or so for the symptoms and signs uh, and uh, for the resolution of the syrinx following posterior fossa decompression and uh, duraplasty, as mentioned. For Chiari 2, remember that it's a different operation. It's a laminectomy and sh um, shunting of the syrinx if it's there. Uh, don't overextend the amount of bony de decompression anywhere. Just do the right amount. If you do too much, you get that cerebellar slump sign, which is really quite challenging to treat. Um, when in doubt, and always make sure that uh, there's no underlying CSF disturbance, because that'll catch you out. If you do a, a bony decompression and a dural patch, but there's an underlying hydrocephalus and big ventricles to begin with, essentially you'll just be sprouting CSF and um, that will, will lead to a CSF leak and you'll regret that. So in that scenario, you may want to consider doing either ETV or putting a shunt in first. And I didn't talk much about this and it's, uh, it's a little bit beyond the scope, at least in children, but um, cranial cervical instability, you know, it's rare that I would have had to treat a, a child who needed uh, stabilization of the occipital cervical junction who had uh, carry malformation. I know it's practiced in some centers. I'm just uh, telling you from our center, it's not that common that we would see that. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.